welcome to Conversations, Lehman College's series of discussions with major theater and musical figures of our time. Our guest today, for the second of a two-part chat, is noted British playwright Sir Arnold Wesker. Welcome back, Sir Arnold. How do you see your place in English theater now, looking back at it? I know you're, you're, you continue to write. You're a very active writer. But um, occasionally, you must look back. What do you, where do you see yourself? Um, finally, that's got to be an, a question answered by those who come after me. Um, but I think I see myself very simply as a playwright who contributed to a mainstream of English theater. Um, and I th I'd like to be known as a, a reasonably important playwright who has contributed to, the, to a really very rich stream uh, uh, of English playwriting. I remember for a while you were part of the kitchen sink you're considered part of the kitchen sink movement. That, that was them. That they, was they, them. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I know I'm in a university, but journalists and academics are incredibly lazy. Mm -hmm. And they, they, they help themselves by splitting uh, time into decades, by giving labels to groups of writers. Schools as in schools of fish. Yes, and as in, yes. And it's not helpful for either understanding the writer um, uh, or for the student. Um, and I get students writing to me about theses that they want to, um, uh, that they're at work on. And they are really some of the most, and they send them to me to read. And of course I can't read them, but when I do dip into them, it's full of such jargon. Right. Um, it, it drives me crazy. And all the jargon misses what the players are really about. And of course, the playwright is supposed not to know what his play is about. Um, it's only the academic who knows what his <laughs> play is about. Um, so it's, it's, it's frustrating. But um, yes, kitchen sink is, means nothing. One of my heroes as a, a playwright is uh, uh, Beaumarchais, the, the marriage of Figo, the barber of Seville. And he was noted, as you are, for writing uh, powerful letters, uh, open letters to people. Oh, really? Oh. I wasn't the only one. <laughs> oh, you have a kindred soul. He got into a lot of hot water uh -huh. uh, with his open letters. Uh -huh. I reread the both your open letters to Trevor Nunn and to uh, um, Sir David Hare. David Hare. Sir Trevor Nunn and Sir David Hare, yes. Okay. I, I was blown away. I just thought they were magnificent. You didn't see them as nails in my coffin. Oh, that's my question. Have they, uh, uh, have, have your, um, these are declarations of war almost, uh, or am I exaggerating? Well, I mean, I would like to think that they were part and parcel of, um, uh, of exchanges between artists in the theater. Um, Do you think they looked at it that way? N n no, because um, uh, no, David, I think, is a little bit humorless. Um, I'll say. Uh, but Trevor is slightly more sinister, mm -hmm. or slightly sinister. David isn't sinister. Um, they certainly never replied. Um, um, or Could you responded explain anyway. a little bit what these letters were, were about? The first one to David Hare was about his play Via Dolorosa. It played here in New York. Yes, for apparently a while. It was greatly successful. Yes. I mean, and a huge success in London. And it came back a second time. And I think someone's planning to bring it back a third time. Uh, and it's a kind of courageous work in that he, um, he delivers it himself. Uh, I don't think he's going to deliver to himself every time it's revived. But uh, the first showing was um, he'd learnt it by heart, and he delivered it from the stage. Um, and I thought it was very, it was impressive that he had done that. Um, but finally, I think it's 
a dishonest play. He has, it's, a, it's a play about his visit to Israel. He meets Palestinians, he meets Israelis, um, he meets one or two political leaders, um, and he comes back with a picture of the state and the state of the state. Um, and I think it's not an entirely honest picture because, well, I give you an example. Um, he, he quotes an Israeli writer um, who says, who makes the point that, that uh, stones are not what the Jews are interested in. The Jews are interested in uh, ideas, not stones for a state. Um, uh, and so fuck the land, says this Israeli writer. Um, and uh, David Hay is very impressed with this, but he doesn't—he doesn't find a Palestinian writer who says fuck the land, um, uh, and let's find another way of getting on. So, so it worried me as a, uh, uh, as a play. Uh, attempting to explore what was happening in, in Israel. And I wrote to him about it. Um, it's uh, a powerful, powerful, powerful piece. Was it published uh, separately, did it, or did you just send it no. via the post? No, I sent it via the post, um, and I put it on my website. Uh -huh. um, I, you know, it's so long ago now. I don't, I don't think it was printed in the newspaper. Um, and the Trevor Nunn piece? Uh... The Trevor Nunn was a, a criticism of his production of The Merchant of Venice, which um, I'm, I had asked, I had suggested to him that he did a double bill of The Merchant of Venice along with my, my Shylock play, and that that would have been kind of interesting. You had one, to have one actor playing the two very, very different roles of um, this uh, famous theatrical Jew. Um, and he wrote back saying, I think you'll find that the way I've directed it uh, does what your play is trying to achieve. Which wasn't true and was kind of impertinent to suggest that a, uh, that a mere production of a play can have the same value as an original can play. Can generate material. Yes. It can't. So I wrote him about it, and I analyzed his production. Um, uh, again, I give you a simple example of what I thought was kind of silly about it. Um, th there's the moment where Shylock wields the knife over the body of Antonio. Um, and just as he's about to cut the flesh, Portia says, tarry a moment. And in the production, Trevor Nunn has the actor um, hovering with a knife, <laughs> as though to suggest that really he's a Jew with a conscience and is, and, and is reluctant to, um, uh, to take the pound of flesh. Um, and so he's doing this, and it goes on forever. And then when he finally goes to the body, Portia says, tarry a moment. Well, you know, the man had been tarrying for ages. Um, so, I mean, the, the, the production was full of silly moments like that. Uh, and, uh, and I wrote this open letter about it. You, you travel a fair bit. Uh, um... I used to when I was young, and when the British Council invited me to travel around the world and, and give lectures and readings. Mm -hmm. um, the British Council is the equivalent of what? You have the American Institute, is it? Or oh, it's the Goethe Institute in Germany, um, the French Institute in France. It's a government-sponsored organization that takes artists around the world right. um, so that there's a, a cultural cross-fertilization. Um, uh, cross and they used to invite me to go all over the world, and they paid, of course, so I traveled. But, um, or I was invited to travel because there was a first night and the theater invited me for the first night. Uh, but I never really had enough money to pick up bags and travel on my own. What uh, kind of theater excites you now? Well, it may sound odd 
to simply say good theatre, um, because that begs the question, what is good theatre? Um, there is a great deal of political correctness in the air, and I think the one responsibility of the playwright is to be politically incorrect. Um, I'll, I'll give you an example of a play that r I really admired, but it was a television play, and it was written by a black writer, um, and uh, a, a female black writer. And the first line in the play comes from a black man who's sitting forlorn in the middle of his bed and says something like, I realize that everything wrong, everything that has gone wrong in my life has been because of uh, a, a black man. Now, the play is about this man who um, was in technology and then, then read, uh, went to a lecture about education and realized that education was very, very important. And he decides to become a teacher. And um, he's a black teacher in a, in a mixed school. And there's one kid who, um, uh, who reports him for having touched him. I mean, because he put his arm on his shoulder encouragingly. And this black kid has a, um, a chip on his shoulder and reports him. And he loses, his, um, he loses his job, and he has a nervous breakdown, and so on. Um, and it's a, a courageous play because it turns criticism into back into the community and says, uh, you know, you must stop being victims. What's happening to us is our own fault. Um, and uh, it was dismissed by a lot who, of critics. Who wrote the play? Do you know, I was afraid you were going to ask me yeah. that. I've forgotten because I'd actually like to get a video of it. But it's called, it's called Shoot the Messenger. Sounds very good. It, it was, it was a very, it had And it was on British television. British television. I mean, it had mm -hmm. some flaws, but by and large, it was um, impressive. So, I mean, that, that really uh, uh, um, uh, excited me. In the theater itself, well, we have seen good, good productions. I mean, we saw good production last night of um, um, uh, the sheriff play. The uh, Journey's End, um, a very good production. But finally, it's a play that simply says war is awful. And war is awful, and we know this, but the play that we really want to see is why did the war happen? What, what were the complex reasons for that, for, for that horrendous First World War? Um, so it's, it's, it's plays that, um, that dare to ask dangerous questions, which, uh, which, which impress me. I, I wanted to show some uh, more of your work. Uh, uh, we have a, a fine video of uh, Break My Heart from 1997. This is a play about uh, um, uh, domestic violence. And it came out of a, a newspaper article that I kept for years about a woman who uh, murdered her husband because he beat her violently. Um, and she couldn't take it any longer uh, uh, and, uh, and, and murdered him. And interestingly, the court did not condemn her for manslaughter. I mean, it's such an open and shut case of uh, domestic violence. They gave her, I don't know, two years probation. Um, and what struck me was that during the court case, she said, he used to beat me most when I used a long word. Oh. And I thought, this is such a powerful metaphor for uh, th those who would bring down the brightest in the class, um, uh, the, the most successful in the world. Um, I, I, I don't know what you think about the Twin Towers, but the Twin Towers seemed to me an action of incredible adolescent spite. Um, and, uh, and this was a metaphor for the same, for the same thing.
your time in restaurants. You're like sucking the spaghetti off the prongs. So I thought I'd please you and give you some foreign mako made. And where did we learn to cook it? Didn't waste my money on cookbooks, did you? Waste my money on fucking cookbooks, did you? No, soft. I went to the library, didn't I? Oh, yes, the library. Might have guessed that one. Spend all your time in a fucking library, don't you? Please, Michael. Wake up one morning and find you gone. Maeve, Maeve, where's my Maeve? Anyone seen my bookworm wife? Yes, yeah, she's gone sleeping with the fucking books. Hidden between sheets of old print, dumping all them famous fucking writers. It would be so much more pleasant to have a conversation... You mean, have a talk? Without you swearing every other word. Very prim, my wife. I'm not prim. Got a delicate soul. There, delicate. I can use long words too, if I like. Delicate, a delicate soul. Long words and swear words. Well, I lay the table. I can use long words, but you can't swear. Oh, I can swear. Show me. I just don't choose to. Dare you. Fuck, fuck, fuck. There. Nothing to it. I just prefer not to talk out of an impoverished vocabulary. A what? An impoverished vocabulary. That what do you think I've got? Come on, my girl, let's eat. How many times must I tell you? No long words. I'm sorry. No long words in my house. I said I'm sorry. I run a simple house. Nothing too exotic in my house. Look, let's eat. We are from simple stock. Let's eat and talk of other things. Simple, honest stock. Of ships and string and sealing wax and cabbages and kings. And fucking poetry as well. Have you gone stark raving mad? I was only trying to amuse you. Amuse me. Amuse me with fucking poetry. Look, the Italian muck will burn. Let it fucking burn. And when it's burned, stick it up your fat fucking ass. I'm off down the road. A fish and chips and a pint. Very powerful. Uh, yeah, it was very disturbing when it was on stage. I mean, it was originally written for a, a lunchtime performance. There's six half-hour plays with uh, television behind it. And they were performed on stage, and then they were televised. Um, as television players. But on the stage performance, there, were, uh, there was a woman who couldn't leave the theater. She was trembling and um, had to be taken out. But it was very, it, it did make an impact. But no one has picked it up. It's, um, it amazes me. Domestic violence is very high on, um, in the, on the concern uh, among, uh, among women and societies. But no one has picked it up uh, as a play to be done uh, in a major venue. I would think that this uh, play would be on uh, other people's uh, lists of dialogues to be done. It's, uh, uh, is it, does it have any other characters in it? No, it's just those two. Two characters. A very powerful piece. Um, now, you're, you're uh, concerned uh, with, um, in, in throughout your career, in, in, in class, in uh, uh, traveling in the classes and, and what the impact of change has on, on class. Uh, this is a subject that seems to fascinate you. And uh, um, are there any other works uh, of that nature? Uh. Um, yes. Um, a, a very complex play called The Journalists, which um, has a very interesting history. Uh, and begins my relationship or non-relationship with Trevor Nunn. Uh, the, the Journalists is a play that was commissioned by the Royal Shakespeare Company and um, uh, the theme is Lilliputianism um, and it struck me that journalism... Uh, what do you mean by Lilliputianism? Reducing, bringing people down to the size uh. you think they ought to be. Ah, Madabad, what's his name, the president of Iran? Yes. I can never pronounce that name. I can't either. Actually Peter. talked about the need to bring America down to size. Yes. Um, and it seems to be a favorite pastime of journalists to reduce, um, uh, bring people down to size, the size they, they think consider. they consider they belong to. Um, and it's um, uh, and all the it's a play for 29 characters. So it's a very large scale play. It's the kitchen 12 years later because um, all, all the journalists are on stage 
at the same time in their different um, offices. So it's a big challenge for a director to um, Has it ever been choreograph done? it. It's not been done professionally. It's been done by amateurs. Um, the only professional production was in Germany, mm -hmm. um, Wilhelmshaven. And I think there was a Yugoslav television version of mm -hmm. it, uh, and it was done on French radio. But, um, but there's never been a major uh, stage version of it, in, certainly not in England. There was one in Los Angeles, oddly enough, and I have a fond fantasy that Sorkin saw the journalists and got the idea for West Wing. <laughs> from it. Adam Sorkin, you mean? Yes. Um, uh, but that's just my vanity. Uh, because the journalists operate in an open... Uh, right. in an, on an open stage like that. Um, and the play was scheduled to be performed at the Royal Shakespeare Company. And the director, David Jones, um, who I think ran the Brooklyn Academy of Music and Drama for a while. Um, uh, he, anyway, he was scheduled to direct it, and the actors refused to perform it. It's never happened before in the English theater or since. Um, but the actors refused to perform it, and um, we will never know why. They didn't tell you? Well, I sued the Royal Shakespeare Company um, because they dropped the play. Instead of saying, we'll put it on next season with a different cast of actors, uh, and this is what Trevor Nunn should have done, um, he dropped it. Uh, and so I sued them because I lost a lot of money as right. a result of it not happening. Um, and in the course of the exchanges going backwards and forwards between solicitors over a period of seven years, they dragged it out. Um, I got explanations from each, they, they canvassed each actor to give a reason why they didn't want to do the play. Um, and I think that the, the, the final picture is that the actors were under the influence of the Workers' Revolutionary Party at that time. Um, and my play has three Tory conservative cabinet ministers who are very intelligent. And the left tends to want to see its enemy as stupid. In cartoon like In John. cartoon -like. And, um, uh, and I think that's the one thing you mustn't do. If you're going to attack someone, you must make it as difficult for case. yourself as possible. Yeah. Um, and so the actors brought the play down. I mean, a, a, a play about Lilliputianism that suffered as a result of a Lilliputian act from the actors. Um, well, that's perfect, in a way. <laughs> yes, uh, not for my career it wasn't. <laughs> I suspect that you're not the only person to have been brought down in, in that way. Uh, there's only, I, I suspect, that there's, uh, there are some subjects in some, uh, uh, in some places that are vetoed. Yes, I think, um, I think there are. I mean, I'm beginning to wonder why no one has picked up Shylock in England. There was one production in Birmingham, city of Birmingham, but I can't persuade either the RSC or the National or the court to put it on. Why do you suppose that's so? Well, I, th I think th the theater wants its favorite Jew, and its favorite Jew is Sh Shakespeare's Shylock. Um, to hold on to him, they can hold on to their prejudices, while at the same time saying um, that their extenuating circumstances, hath not the Jew eyes, hath not the Jew senses, and so on. Um, so they can hold on to their prejudices with a certain equanimity because the play makes excuses um, on behalf of the Jew, which I think, as I said earlier, was more whitewashing than anything else. Uh, and they want to hold on to that image of Why the, of do they the want to now? No, Jews aren't very popular now, are they? No. Uh, because of what's are happening in Israel. Are they particularly unpopular in England right now? I, I think they, they are, yes. But the people will then turn to you and say, wait a minute, Tom Stoppard's a successful playwright and he's Jewish. Nick Heitner, who runs the National Theatre, is Jewish. Um, and Harold Pinter, who's been given the Nobel Prize, is Jewish. Um, but in a strange way, I think they're, 
they're all very safe writers. Right. Right. This subject is is talked about by uh, Jews who have a problem with being Jewish in David Mamet's book, Wicked Son. Uh huh. It'd be very interesting uh, sometime to hear your opinion. Uh, I can see that uh, we're being asked to wind up this show. The time has passed too quickly, and I wish we lived closer so I could have you on the show more often. Um, you call back people back twice, do you? I, I have. You have another piece I wanted to hear. From okay. Longitude. Longitude. Would you read it? It's a short yeah, well, piece. this is much shorter than the, uh, than the love letter on, on, on blue paper. Longitude, some of you may know, is a book written by David Sobel about this uneducated genius in the 17th century who invented the clock that could be taken to sea. And there was a 20,000 pound prize available for anyone who could solve this problem of how to identify longitude and spent all his life trying to get the full prize. And he never could. Uh, and I saw it as a play about um, uh, uneducated genius against the establishment, which I... Anyway, uh, here is a short speech by, um, from the play. Uh, I, I adapted David Sobel's book. Um, and his son, William, is saying to him, you're a th talking about the, uh, the establishment, you're a thorn in their side, father. They want thee dead. Well, die I won't, he says. I hell will not die. <laughs> I know all about them as glory in the end of things, the passing of this and that. He's had his day, they say, with sadness in their voice and glee in their dried up hearts. Expect no more from him. His days are ended, done. Well, pass I will not, an end I won't and more there is, and they can choke with glee, for I've got oak and god and cleverness, where they've got naught but three chins and a shiny ass. Oh, yes, I know such men. Beware of them, William lad. They'll drain joy from a nightingale, dampen your sun, and lay waste the best in you. But not in this carpenter, not in this clockmaker, not in this bell ringer, don't ask from whence, but I've got energies and fires in me to last ten lives and ring them all to hell. What a beautiful way to close. Thank you so much for being on the show, Sir Arnold Wesker, and thank you, our home and studio audience, for being here today. We hope to join you again soon for further conversation. Thank you. Rebels. Jewish rebels, both of us. Both of us gone as. <laughs> but different, see? I mean, different kinds of rebels. Rather to be precise. And you have to be precise in matters of importance. And I was always one for being precise. He rebelled against the Jewish community. And me, I rebelled against the oppressors of the Jewish community.